Brothers and sisters. Amen. Bow our heads. Father God, we uh, ask you to bless this reading of your word, Lord. And I ask you, Father God, to bless me as I read, Father. Yes. So this whole congregation that uh, be blessed. We're, we're here because of you and for you, Lord, and, and on your time, Father. Yes. So let us be used to the greatest effect. Yes. In Jesus' name, yes. amen. 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 <clears throat> well, I've been uh, asked by the Lord to talk on faith and dominion, correction, authority and dominion. And uh, I know the brother's been asked to talk about faith and another sister asked to talk about prayer. So last week I had mentioned very briefly Daniel and uh, David and Goliath. I'm going to ask everyone to turn to Daniel chapter 6, please. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, Daniel uh, was a Jew, and he was captured with some other Jews by King Nebuchadnezzar, and he was asked to come into the court to serve. Uh, he was part of a royal family and he was healthy and he was strong and he was good looking and he was smart and King Nebuchadnezzar wanted him to serve in his court. So fast forward, I'm going to go to here to chapter 6. I'm just going to read. Uh, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, the three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities, the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. You see, the purpose that these men had set out was to try to trap him within his religion and with what he is obligated to God for, try and set something in, in opposition to okay. that. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they went as a group to the king and said, make King Darius live forever. Royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed the king should issue an edict and enforce a decree. Anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. And when Daniel learned the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room with the windows open toward, toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. No royal edict, no governmental decree changed Daniel's worship of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, he was able to continue to worship because he believed for God. He believed in faith. Yes, yes. he had faith that, well, if I worship the Lord, nothing's going to nothing's gonna harm me. Nothing, nothing will come against me. Right. Nothing will ultimately harm me. I'll ultimately be victorious in this. And these men knew, did this, because they knew <coughs> what? He's either going to stop praying, or if he doesn't, then he's going to get thrown to the lion's den. So this is life or well, death. That's a word for this generation. Amen. Yeah, this is life or death. Amen. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree during the next 30 days? Anyone who prays to any God or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den. And the king answered. Decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, these guys are very lordly in the trap they set up for the king. 
They said to the king, Daniel, who's one of your exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you. Your majesty ordered the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. And when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. Now, we'll read on. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Amen. What verse is he at? 14. This is verse 14. So he realized he kind of got hoisted by his own guitar here and was trying to figure out a way around it, but he'd already talked himself into something. Right. Right. Because he had esteemed himself and uh, let himself get caught up in his own belief that he is a god here on this earth. But if he really was, then he wouldn't be hoist by the guitar, amen? Amen. <laughs> he wouldn't have to make this decree. Nobody else is going to worship me. It wouldn't matter if they did or if they didn't. Um, let me move on. Then the man went as a group to King Darius and said to him, so they're not letting him cut loose, okay? He tried till sundown and then just kind of sat there. The men went as a group to King Darius said to him, Remember your majesty. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict of king issues can be changed. The king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. And the stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating, without entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. He recognized that something terrible was taking place here. Right. He knew that he was doing something wrong. Right. And whether he understood it or not, he was also appealing. In appealing to Daniel, he was also appealing to God. Now, where Daniel is right now in this lion's den, Nobody is taking these things to PetSmart to groom them. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Nobody Come on. has a fire hose and is cleaning this cage out. Right. These things are used for punishment. Nobody feeds these things kibble. These things eat people. Right. There's nothing stronger in the kingdom. There's nothing more terrifying. There's no animal more able-bodied to drive fear into people. This is the reason that they have this lion's den. It's dark, it's dank, it smells. There is uh, human offal in that cage along with the lion's own offal in that cage, in this den. And it's dark, and there's nobody in there cheering him on. This is Daniel and David. <clears throat> Correction, Daniel and God. What has changed with God in this lion's den? Not a thing. The environment changed, yes. The desires of men changed, yes. The favors of men changed, yes. Nothing changed with God and Daniel. That's a good word. Amen. Amen. Don't let anything change with you. Because if he'd have walked in there in fear, those lions would have smelled it and they'd have had at it. Amen. And God also would have recognized there ain't no faith in this one. And those lions would have had at it. He was thrown in there as food. The first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. And when he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Now this wasn't so much of a question as also an appeal. Daniel answered, May the king live forever. Now think about that. This king just threw him in there. Yes. May the king live forever. Wow. I, I don't. There's that very word. few little few things he probably could have said that would have knocked you over with a feather. That's probably the last thing that that king expected to hear. Amen. He probably expected to hear anything in the world other than, "Well, may the king live forever." He was given a greeting. Daniel didn't forget who he was, and being in that lion's den didn't change who he was. It didn't change who he was with God, and it didn't change who he was with the king. Changed his attitude. That's right. So when the king came, he still addressed him as a king. Wow. May the king live forever. Wow. Respect now, and honor didn't leave him because circumstances changed. Amen. Now think about whenever you hit your hammer with you mm -hmm. hit your thumb with the hammer or you stub your toe That's and somebody comes up word. to you and wants to help you out, and what do you do? You ball them out or you get upset or 
something explicative leaves your mouth, right? Yes. This man was thrown in the lion's den, and he says, well, man, the king went forever. I've said this before about some of the things that God has done. Uh, man, that that's that's really cool right there. Hey, Amen. There, there's really something behind that that's very powerful. <clears throat> Steadfast heart. Mm -hmm. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They've not heard me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. Now, see, you got to understand, the king didn't issue this edict because he thought Daniel was doing something wrong. The king was tricked into it. Yes. Therefore, the offense wasn't against the king. And that's why Daniel could say, I didn't wrong you, despite the edict that was pronounced. Because Daniel was doing his job as unto the Lord. Yes. Here he was in this, in this Babylonian kingdom, but yet he was being shown high honor, even by the king who didn't worship God. So what happened here? God backed Daniel in the fight. Yes. Not out of it. Amen. Now, he knew that Daniel could go in that den and could come out the same way. Now, the Lord can always make a way of escape. And we can look at this and say, well, he made a way of escape. He sent the angel in there. If that man was thrown into that lion's den and didn't walk in there in faith, he'd have been consumed. Yes, he would. Yes, he would. So God backed him up. Nothing changed between Daniel and the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let me continue to read here. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. When Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him. This is verse 23. And it says why. No wound was found on him. Somebody finish that. Because he believed in his God. Because he had trusted in his God. Amen. 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 He trusted in his God. Now, if you don't have any trust in the authority and the dominion that God has given you, that wherever he sets you, you are walking in that authority, you are in that dominion, you're supposed to, you're at where you're supposed to be, even though you may not like the surroundings, <clears throat> well, that's good. you'll get hurt. You have to trust in your God. Hallelujah. At the king's command, command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. This guy's happy and excited. He wants everybody to be happy and excited. He goes on to say, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Amen. He, if he put himself on a pedestal, he took himself off real quick. Let me read. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. Amen. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. God's dominion. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That's transferred to all of us and we can operate in it. Now in this instance, Daniel didn't go in there and put the mouths of the lions. God sent an angel to do it for him. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. You got to have faith in God's dominion. If you're going to be able to exercise in your own. Yes. Because he's giving it to you. Yes, amen. amen. Let's go back to uh, 1 Samuel 17. Hallelujah. Good word. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. This is David and Goliath. And the whole army of God stood still because one man talked trash. Now the Philistines gathered their first forces for war and assembled at Soka and Judah. And they pitched camp at Ephes Demim between Soka and Azekah. 
And Saul and the Israelites, this is King Saul, assembled and camped in the valley of Elah. And they drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits in a span, so that's nearly ten feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. So he's got 125 pounds of armor on. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Now that's the devil speaking right there. Who are they the servants of? The Lord. What does the devil do? He'll just take you off just one degree. And if he can fix you in that, he's got you. Now all of a sudden, these guys are in their heads thinking, well, I'm just, yeah, we're the servants of Saul. You're the servants of somebody even higher than Saul. You're the servants of the Most High God. So if you operate as a servant of Saul, or you operate as a servant of TC, or you operate as a servant of Teresa, well, guess what? Then you're limited by only the power that these two people can exude. And that's exactly the danger we're in when everybody's looking for Trump to save America. Yeah, Roger that. Amen. Absolutely. They can't recognize or understand how he got there, the post turtle. Yes. Yes. Missing out, they're missing the point. Let's see. Choose a man and have him come down to me. Now he's telling them what to do. He's telling them who they are. Wow. Now he's telling them what to do. That is a good word. And if he's able to fight and kill me, we'll become your subjects. Now he's telling them the outcome. But if I overcome him and kill him, you'll become our subjects to serve us. And there's not a single individual in that Israel army. Looking at Goliath, thinking none of us are ever going to overcome him. So now he's just talking. He's telling them who they serve. He's cut God out of the service. Now he's telling them what to do. And now he's telling them the outcome. And by his mere appearance, he wants them to imagine what that outcome is going to be a thought and an imagination. Yes. 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 Those things are supposed to be cast down. Come on, bro. Yes. Let's see. Good. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. Well, yeah, you are defying. He is defying the armies of Israel, but truly he's defying God. The armies of the Lord. That's right. Mm -hmm. But he's keeping that. He doesn't want to invoke the name of the Lord. No darkness right. ever does. So, and then he's telling them again what to do. Give me a man and let us fight. Now he's talking to them as if this is their only choice. Goliath is quite the used car salesman here. He's got it winnowed down that this is really all that you can do. You can fight me and lose and then become our servants. You've got the whole army of God here. So what's taking place? They marched up in dominion and in authority under a king that God had appointed to them because of all of their griping. They wanted a king like everybody else. They got one. Now here's the whole army of God. And one man's come out. An evil man is who? He really knows that that army will defeat them. No wicked man is going to put himself out there thinking that he's going to truly have to give up anything or give up his blood. That spirit of wickedness. Yes. He went out there trying to circumvent the power of God. He got their attention. Hey, Israel. Yo, servants of Saul, this is what you need to do. And they all just kind of got entranced, right, by this snake, by this serpent. Yes. And they just fell for it. The enemy's trying to determine the battlefield for them. And we're not supposed to let him do that. There's nothing that prevented the army of God from going over there and wiping those Philistines out. God wanted them wiped out. Amen. And to this day, truly, none of them exist. Now, there's people that may 
and have it or occupy some of the areas of the land that they used to. But as a people, as a bloodline, they're done. Satan's always trying to dictate the terms of battle. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, good word. <laughs> on hearing the Philistines' words, his words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So one man spoke fear to the entire army. Because right now, and I'll say the army of Saul because they're not operating as the army of God right now. Right. Spoke, spoke fear on. to the army of Saul. You're not going to speak fear in the army of the Lord. You'll speak fear in the army of Saul. He spoke fear in the army of Saul. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse. who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. <clears throat> the first was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third, Shammah, and David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth with Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. So what's taking place in the 40 days? For 40 days, the enemy has determined the field of battle and how it's going to be conducted. For 40 days, they've defied God. For 40 days, all of the promises, because God has you something to do, there's going to be something that's going to come back to you first for his kingdom and then things are going to be added to you now for 40 days these guys are bereft of whatever it was that god wanted them to do and accomplish because they're frozen in fear because of one thing one man right mm -hmm. now jesse said to his son david take the seed for the roasted grain these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit see how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. There was Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Well, dad wishes they were fighting, but they weren't fighting. Right. They were frozen in fear. Right. Now, early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse directed. He reached the camp as the army was going to battle position, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with him, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his, now it's just usual defiance. And David heard it. And when the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Amen. So battle lines are breaking. This fear is growing also stronger today they're expecting to see because they have been suckered into this vision of well we've got to have a champion here somewhere well God is your champion go forward as his army and you march over these Philistines that's what was intended now the Israelites have been saying do you see how this man keeps coming out he comes out to defy Israel the king will give great wealth to the man who kills him he will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel King should have taken Goliath's head. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, David properly defined who they were. Amen. He asserted in his words, no, 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 this is my place. We're part of the armies of the living God. Yes. Yes? Yes. A redefinition is taking place here of what this battlefield is supposed to be. They repeated to him what they'd been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. So he's asking in such a way, he's already talking about it as it's a done thing. Well, okay, well, who's, what's the man get who kills him? That wouldn't even occur to him. That hadn't really occurred to anybody else. They're telling everybody else, this is what you'll get. He's asking as one expecting to receive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with this man, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? With whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I don't know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Mm -hmm. So David's not going to let himself get dismayed. 
Now what have I done, said David? Can I even speak? And what now what did he do? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. He's not going to listen to his brother. Because his brother's speaking out of fear and his brother's speaking out of anger. His brother's speaking lost. Turn away. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul. And Saul sent for him. And David said to Saul, a shepherd boy saying to the king, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. I would think that would brought Saul to the point where he realized, I need to step up here and be king. I need to lead these men. I mean, I've been put by God in charge of these armies. Now, no one man should be stopping us. He should have felt some shame when David was telling him this. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man. He's been a warrior from his youth. What do you know about fighting? Right. David said to Saul, your servant's been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. The son circumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Because he's defiled, he's defied the armies of the living God. <coughs> the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. It is a foregone conclusion. There is nothing that represents anything in this world that God can't overcome for this young shepherd. Amen. Amen. And it's not ignorance. It's not arrogance. It's simply a matter of fact. Come on. Amen. Amen. He speaks it because he walks into it. <clears throat> Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. That's really not a lot of encouragement. That's like, all right, well, I'll pray for you. <laughs> yeah. Do you Lord be with you because we're not. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. We're going to watch this. We're not going to help at all. Saul dressed, Saul dressed David in his own tunic. And he put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. And David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. You will fight how you train. You should train how you intend to fight. Amen? There's a way that you've been trained up to fight that everybody in here has had success with, that has witnessed other brothers and sisters of Christ fighting and had success. Now, you wouldn't go out and seek somebody else because of a title or because of how they were dressed or because of how many men they led and say, okay, well, I've had success in this, but let me go Look how this man is dressed and look at his title. Look at all the people he leads. Hey, how do you do this? You're going to fail. Mm -hmm. David recognized that he would have failed if he had tried to do it like Saul. Because how, how was Saul doing it? How effective was Saul at that point in time? Zero. Right. Mm -hmm. If uh, the right equipment doesn't mean you're going to be victorious. Yeah, that's right. You can wear all the accoutrement you want to. But look, if this guy over here is shuddering his boots, I've got no interest in lacing those things up on my feet. Amen. Right? Amen. Then he took his staff in his hand. He took them off. He took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, and put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and went to sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. And meanwhile, the Philistine with the shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome. Glowing with health and handsome. It is important that the red...
we should go about in health and handsome. Amen. And I don't mean health and handsome like what style hair cream you use. Thank you. What kind of lipstick, right? Mm -hmm. Or how well your suit fits or doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. But have a look about you of health and vigor, okay? <clears throat> Redeemed from the curse and clothed in the glory of the Lord. Yes, absolutely. We should seek to go about the same way. Uh, yeah. You know, get your have your cheeks red, have a glow about you, put fresh oil on, yes. Amen. And go about walking in the way, determined to be seen in the way that God sees you. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Look, uh, let's see, glowing with health and handsome, and he, the, Phil, uh, the Philistine Goliath, he despised him. And he said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David wasn't going to let this Philistine defy on the battlefield any longer. And David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. I come against you in the name. Hallelujah. In the name. In the name. Hallelujah. Not in Saul's armor. Hallelujah. Not with Saul's sword. Thank not you. in Saul's tunic. I come at you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Hallelujah. The God of, not the army of Saul. The God of the armies of Israel. Yes. yes. Whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And this very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army. He just went right past Goliath. Yes. And went the whole army. Come on, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. To the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know what? There is a God in Israel. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen and understand how wickedness and evil operates. It wants you to focus on it singularly. Yes. And weigh yourself against it. Mm. Notice how the wicked always seem to be a little bit stronger, a little bit taller, yes. a little bit more ferocious, yes. full of a false bravado. And there always seems to be more of them, right? Right. Look, the, the Philistines possessed an armor and a weaponry that the Jews didn't possess. They didn't have this type of armor. They didn't have this type of shields. They didn't have the same type of swords. Don't fall for this. Because if you try to do it in your own strength, believe me, everybody in here knows the world is going to come and rip the carpet right out from underneath Amen. you. Amen. Good preaching. So he put himself where he should be. Well, I'm going to put myself right here under the very hand of God. Amen. Right here I'm safe. And I can speak God and I can speak of the Lord of, of, of hosts and I can speak of the God of Israel and I can talk about all of the things that he's going to do and I'm safe right here. Hallelujah. But if I step out of it and make and let it be about this Philistine because he's got me ticked off well then I'm going to slip. So he stayed under the hand of God and he spoke about the power of the army and the authority and the dominion of God. Yes. And God said, okay, I'm going to keep you right in there. There you go, David. Go forth. Let's see. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. Everybody say that. For the, the battle, battle is, is the Lord's. Lord's. Amen. One more time. The battle, battle is, is the Lord's. Lord's. Amen. And he Hallelujah. will give all of you into our hands. So, Goliath came out on the battlefield and started running this. Yes. David came out on the battlefield and said, In the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 This is what we must all do. Amen. Whenever your Goliath comes. Amen. Amen. That's our authority. Amen. As the Philistines moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> David ran right out. He took the battle to him. Amen. Instead of putting up with an illusion and thoughts and imaginations Amen. and condemnation. Amen. Took him on head on because he believed every, because he believed everything that he said. 
He believed that God is right here. And he knows that God is right here with him. And God's saying, David, I'm with you. Let's go. Okay, Lord, he's running with God. Amen. 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 Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it in and struck the Philistine on the forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. And David ran and stood over him, and he took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. And after he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. And when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Amen. Because they put, what, all of their faith Amen. in flesh. In flesh. Yeah. And God brought that flesh down. And he's doing it today. And he'll continue to do it. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. And their dead were strolled along the Sharaim road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered the camp. David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem. And he put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistines, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? And Abner replied, as surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. The king said, find out who this young man is. And as David returned from killing the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. And David said, I am the son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 David spoke in authority and dominion. He recognized that all of the power that comes from that was God's, but he invoked the name. This is look, this man is in a physical battle. Yes. As all of us have been in a physical battle and are in various stages of physical battles right now. Thank you. In a physical battle, David knew that was in spirit. Yes. Amen. If he didn't know that, he never would have went out there. He just said, hey, Saul, guess what? Uh, you may as well go out there and, and hand your sword over to Goliath because there's not one amongst us here that can stand against him. Well, in the flesh, that's true. The flesh is where the enemy operates. Yes. So how do you overcome the flesh? In the spirit. In the spirit. How did David do that? And standing in front of the thing that anybody in Vegas would have laid odds, it would have been a foregone conclusion. Nobody would be taking bets. Amen. It would have been crazy. Yes. There's no way that this shepherd boy can defeat this giant. He stands nearly 10 feet tall. He didn't even have to wear any armor. That giant just go out there with the stick and take it to everybody. The battle was in the spirit, and David knew that from the get-go. That's why he's like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And it's not a nothing thing that he mentioned the circumcision, because circumcision was a sign of God's people. Yes. That's a sign of, of the uh, the covenant. Like, well, this guy's not even covenant. Who is this? He's automatically seeing things. God was up there saying the same thing. What are y'all doing? Who is this? Yeah. That stands before. I have given you. You got everything that you need to do this. God did not have to do another thing for those people to have victory. He gave an army, right? He had a covenant of victory. That's yeah. right. Amen. They did. In fact, had a covenant of victory. <clears throat> and everybody out there on that field who was exhibiting faith, not one man in that army, not even the king himself. And the king didn't even feel, and I, he, I don't know, I venture to say, Saul probably felt relieved. Well, let this boy go do it. That'll stay me off for at least another 10 minutes while I got to fix this thing and figure right, out what to do. Right, amen. Because he had no clue what to do. None. David knew instinctively. Amen. Brothers and sisters, our battle is in the spirit. Mm -hmm. Our dominion is in the spirit. Yes. And 
where you take your authority and when you take your dominion, yes. this yes. comes from God and he will give you the victory. Yes. He will take you all the way through it. So it doesn't matter what you're fighting. <clears throat> and this illustrates that perfectly. It doesn't matter. There's a reason that Goliath was 10 feet tall. So God could show, God is showing us here. Yes. It, 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 there's lots of Goliaths in the world. Amen. And you can't count on yourself and you can't count on your own flesh and you can't count on your own skill. Amen. And I tell this to uh, uh, all of these men that I work with. Look, if you put your identity in who you were as a soldier, somebody's going to have a better war story than yours. Yes. Somebody's going to have done three tours in Afghanistan. And if you were a ranger, well, I know a guy over here who's Delta Force. And if you were Delta Force, I know a guy over here, a guy over here who's in charge of, uh, you know, whole units of Delta Force over here. And if you were a cop, well, I know this one guy in Chicago, and you should have heard the things that he did. Right. And so on and so on and so on. you got to take your identity out of this world. Yes, yes. David's identity wasn't in this world. David, from the get-go, his identity was in Christ. Amen. That's how he could go forward with all of this courage. Amen. As soon as you try and do it all on your strength, the world's going to come against you with your life and say, can't, can't defeat this. The world's always ready to meet you head on with something that's outside of your strength. Amen. Amen. That's how the world overcomes Christians. And because they don't know any better, they think, well, you know, I don't have the money to defeat that. Well, you know, that relationship, and that's just gone down the, you know, just got to live and let live and let that go, brother. You're never going to that and on and on and on well you know i'm i'm sorry that you're you're battling with that issue right there you know it's just uh one of those things you got to live with you know there's wonderful homes out there that'll care for you until you kick the bucket wow. and that's it right. because what can you do in your own flesh when your own flesh has betrayed you right with cancer or alcoholism when your own flesh tries to betray you daily with lust daily with anger daily with fear daily with anxiety what do you do Better take it to God because that battle's in the spirit. The enemy is going to try and define that battlefield. And if you allow it to be defined here in the flesh, you'll always, always, always be overcome in the flesh. Amen. Take it all in the spirit. That's where your authority and your dominion lie. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.